Hi, everybody. I'd like to welcome you to another uh, Society for Education and Anesthesia webcast podcast. And uh, today it is my great pleasure to have Dr. Karina Yu uh, as our featured faculty member and project today. Uh, Dr. Yu is an assistant professor of clinical anesthesia at uh, Indiana University School of Medicine, and she's been on the faculty for about five years. Um, her interests include diversity, mentorship, and strategy, and also she serves on the board of directors uh, for the Indiana Society of Anesthesiologists, and she's also active in the ASA. Um, she's the lead advisor at Indiana University for the Anesthesia Student Interest Group, and she's their career mentor liaison, which is a little bit about the project that she's been working on and that she's going to describe today. It's related to that. Um, she's been working towards her MBA, and uh, so I wish her the best of luck with that. I'm sure that's quite a stress to be able to do while she's um, doing her, her being a faculty member in an academic department. So welcome, Dr. Yu. And um, if you don't mind, I'll call you Karina. So you and I can be informal on this. I like to do these as informal interviews. So the first thing I always like to start out with is to try to help um, our membership understand, you know, what was the problem you were trying to solve? What did you identify was the issue? Well, first of all, thanks for having me, Glenn. I think the problem that we faced was that we um, had medical students off clinical rotations due to COVID. And so by the time that students were allowed to come back into the anesthesia realm, we had 61 medical students interested in matching into anesthesiology as fourth year medical students. We had to rotate through starting mid-August. Wow. So that was a huge problem. And so traditionally we've had a four week adult anesthesia elective. We also do have about a two week anesthesia clerkship that all third years go through. Um, so they do get that initial experience and exposure there. But we had to condense the four weeks that we normally offer to those students to two weeks. And so with that many students, you have to imagine there were a lot of logistical issues that we had to work through. And the biggest priority for us is how do we help them successfully match and have the same exposure to attendings, to clinical cases, subspecialty uh, off opportunities for letters of recommendation? How do we let them shine in two weeks uh, instead of the four weeks that they normally have to really get exposure to the department? That does sound like a challenge. Uh, it's not one of those problems you had to identify. It was it slapped you in the face because of COVID. Yes. Um, now, I guess an obvious question is 61 medical students interested in anesthesia. Either you are doing a great job with the anesthesia interest group or, you know, how big is your medical school class? I mean, that's a big number. You know, and I can't quote exact numbers there, but I believe, you know, our medical school is one of the largest in the country. On top of which, I am claiming credit for, um, we did have 11 students that were allowed to do away rotations because of uh, location proximity and availability of anesthesia in their institution. Right. So I'll claim credit for 50 of them. Okay. But how big, roughly just ballpark, how big is your medical student class? I mean, I think they have 300, mid 300s. Mid 300s, okay. But so, so that means still you were, uh, you know, a pretty good percentage of them wanted to go or at least expressed interest in going into anesthesia. Well, uh, that's that's kudos to you. I th well, right. well, so yeah, now that's our department. I, th I think a lot of it happens to be because of the clerkship. They get exposure very early on uh, right. and they like it. So, yeah, that's clear. If they have a great experience on their initial rotation, um, and that's a message to us all. You know, the better that we do with that initial experience with anesthesia, the better we can do to attract top top candidates. So you're right. Okay, so now you got a problem. Um, how is your going to department help you, you know, solve this problem, either in terms of resources, time? Because this is always the issue with any project that any faculty wants to undertake. You know, usually it's under resourced. You know, was there any resources that were going to be available to you? People, money, whatever it was. What? What kinds of things did you have to be able to take advantage of to help you uh, come up with your solution? Well, so for starters, um, this was new for me and I understood what a large undertaking it would be and how much time it would take. So I did not accept the position until I was given academic time to do so. Okay. Now, if that's not a secret, how much academic time were you given to be able to, uh, to work on this project? I don't think it should be a secret, but I was given 0 0.1. 0.1. Okay. Um, so, so two days a month, really. Week, 
I mean, so it's one day for each of the two week rotations that I had to coordinate, get the students going, figure out grading. And I mean, really for the months leading up to mid August, uh, I was creating that curriculum from scratch. Okay, was this an on this is though it sounds like it was going to be an ongoing commitment uh, where you're going to be that rotation director um, for the future. Is that right? That was the anticipation. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. All right. So now you got this problem. You got to compress it into two weeks. Tell us a little bit about how you made a two week curriculum. You know, what did it turn out to be? What was your solution? So we had a couple different things. I mean, I think traditionally we had had maybe a half day that was spent on orientation. So, you know, I, I, I took that out completely. Every single day counted. They had to be in the OR if they could be. So we created a virtual um, videos for orientation at two of the sites that we had. We had two different hospital sites. Um, Dr. Tim Webb and Dr. Daniel Gio were my um, site directors. And so we created orientation videos so that the students would know exactly where to get where they needed to on their first day, where to get the equipment they needed, how to change, get their scrubs, and um, see the schedule and see where they were supposed to be. Our goal was to connect them to the resident on the first day, because from there, they had a point of contact, someone could help. Um, Got it. So that was one of the first goals. Um, How long was that video, about 10 minutes? I think the orientation videos were, I created a 10 minute, 10 to 15 minute orientation video of the entire elective. Okay. And to explain all the different components that they needed to follow through Canvas and in person and the different rules and how the grading worked and the expectations. And then the orientation videos were probably in the two to five minute range of what to do on your first day. Okay. And on the Canvas modules, they had to complete those orientation uh, modules and click through it as a prerequisite to access the rest of the curriculum for each of the days. Okay. And how much work were they expect? So actually we should just orient everybody. So it sounds like there was going to be an online curriculum that Correct. ran simultaneously with their operating room experience or the other experiences you're about to describe. And uh, prior to starting their rotation, there was pre uh, rotation materials that they needed to click on. Uh, uh, they needed to work through on Canvas. I assume they already had experience with Canvas. Were they already using it in medical school or was it something new to them? I think that they, and I, I'm not super clear. They they had used Canvas a few times before. I'm sh I'm sure some stuff had happened okay. during COVID that required it. Um, okay. If not, they adapted very well. So How, and so uh, you said there was an orientation video and then a general over for the entire course, and then there was a couple of orientation videos to get them started on their first that were day. Site specific. Yes. Yeah. Was there anything else that uh, that they needed to do as a prerequisite before starting the course? Um, I'm trying to remember now. I did ask a, a survey from them. I okay. wanted to know some data beforehand that I could measure what they've done before or their thoughts about COVID and their pr positive pressure, you know, their PPE, personal protective equipment. And so I could compare that at the end of this, the two weeks to see if I'd made a difference. Okay. I, do, uh, I also, as far as resources, um, I also had an excellent um, anesthesia clerkship or elective coordinator, uh, Belinda Sanborn. So she did a lot of the heavy lifting on the Canvas site for me as far as arranging and organizing that. Because I think aside from my MBA, I wouldn't have had a lot of exposure to Canvas to know what the functionality and the capabilities are of that platform to be able to quickly figure out the best way to make it work. Um, and one of the challenges we did have is because because I ended up having so many students rotate through, ordinarily the Canvas site is set up best for a class that once it's completed, you create a new Canvas site for each class, but I wasn't going to create a new Canvas site every two weeks. So the main thing that complicated there was just that my grading ended up having a very long, large spreadsheet of each rotation uh, through it. But okay. That that was just one of the issues because you had all 50 students go or 60 students go through the class, but they just happen to start at different times. So it, it made right. things a little bit more complicated. Just maybe give everybody, you know, because some people may not be familiar with campus. It's a learning management system an online learning management system. Can you tell us about just a couple you know, the, what were the basic features that you needed to utilize uh, to get your course going? The basic things that I used was, I mean, I could posted files so that they had access to learning materials. They have discussion forums, which is like any sort of 
forum where they could put posts and read other people's posts and um, and they can also take quizzes on there. So okay. the components that we used primarily for the first seven days, well, we had a journal club reading. So I assigned an actual article every single day for seven days, which is a lot. And they had to do a quick little response on there uh, and maybe answer some two to three quiz questions just to show that they read it. It was more content recall. And I really liked this article because it taught me what the N in N95 stands for. Um, or I learned that cricoid pressure is sometimes useful this time or that time. And part of what we did with the journal club discussions is also offer opportunity into the subspecialties because people may be interested in pursuing anesthesiology because they want to be a chronic pain doctor, but not have exposure to that. So right. uh, we did try to include exposure to OB and pediatrics and acute pain and ICU also within those articles. And just for safety's sake, I think that there's some baseline PPE information that any student entering into an anesthesiology elective should now know. And so even now as the selective has continued and we're several months into COVID and people have been wearing N95s for quite some time, after they read these articles, they're still learning things like, oh, I didn't realize I was supposed to do a fit check every single time I wear my mask. So I think those things are really critical that we're protecting our students in that fashion. Okay. Um, and then the case log discussions that we did online, we had daily, that was to increase their case counts uh, exposure. So rather, you know, because we only had two weeks instead of four weeks, now, however many cases, they would share one case a day and talk about their pre-op, inter-op, post-op plan, uh, give a one-liner about the patient and a learning pearl. And so every day they posted this, they were able to see all of their classmates and, and people like to know what, what's going on. So, they, oh, you know, what did you learn today? Oh, these people are in these sorts of cases and that's really interesting. So they learn about, you know, five to 12 other cases every day. And a lot of that they could even use, I encouraged them. I said, you know, when you write your personal statement, you can include anything you learned, whether you learned it through somebody else's case or whether it was your own experience, you're still writing about what you're learning on the selective. I love the way that you've integrated the reflection and how they might be able to use that to help them in their residency application. I think that's a, that's a really neat thing. So what I heard you say was that they've got a, one article to read every day. And Perfect. then in addition to that, that they are expected to post um, about whatever, at least one case that they did today in sort of the forums aspect of it. Oh, I forgot to mention, and of course, then the articles will may have two or three short quiz questions. Correct. Okay. And then on the eighth, the eighth, ninth, and tenth day, there were no journal articles anymore because instead I created a teaching video presentation that I asked them to do. So the idea behind that was we knew that virtual interviews were going to be the future. And so I wanted to give them an opportunity to practice these interviews or just their presentation skills. And so I created an IU Anesthesia YouTube channel and for some of their students got posted publicly that I also wanted to highlight sort of the knowledge and expertise that medical students have. I think sometimes medical students, because they are in their training, are not seen as the same professionals as people who may pursue shorter routes in their medical careers and finish sooner. Um, but I, I think medical students have so much to offer. If anything, they've rotated through all the specialties and have sometimes the most amount of information in their heads when they're studying for step two CK. Uh, well, I, I'm a little unclear though. Did you say that the last four days, roughly eight, 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 nine and 10, at least those last three days, were they giving a presentation? You asked each of them to give a little presentation. So and yeah, they would do it on their own time and then post it to the YouTube channel. Yes, it was a two minute video. So okay. they posted, a, they took a video of themselves on and posted it on day eight, on day nine, they watched everybody else's videos and commented on it. And then on day 10, I asked for a reflection essay that for many people was their personal statement. Um, so I offered office hours to everybody um, once a week for 15 minute slots. So there were some that really took me up on it and even pursued it there afterwards, I met with one student maybe seven or eight times because my office hours weren't filled up. But during that time period, 
I wanted to practice Zooming with them so that they could practice those skills in a Zoom interview, interacting, and I'd give them tips. Some, you know, sometimes people don't notice that they have nervous tics that they do a lot or they wrinkle their eyebrows constantly. Let me know if I'm doing any while we're in this interview. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, and I'm not perfect either, but I, I could I could let them know, you know, hey, I'd, I'd review their personal statement and their CV as quickly as I could. And I think the, the challenge for some students is they may not be used to receiving critique quickly. And I had to sort of tell them, I was like, look, the average person reviewing your application is going to spend like a minute perusing your personal statement. If that, like, it, it's just, that's the fact. Like, I, I want to read, I want to see topic sentences. I want to see a strong thesis. I want to, I want to see key words as I'm, I'm skimming through this just to get a good idea about whether you understand what our field is like and what your future will entail. It's and, the truth. And, and now with the flags, you got to put that up front. Yeah. And now with COVID, um, I think uh, residency programs are getting a lot more applications uh, than they have. And so there's even more having to just uh, skim through. Well, I am so impressed, though, about the real focus of your rotation to really help uh, medical students in the process and, and be prepared. Yeah, that's super great. I, I love what you've done. Um, one thing I might ask, and I usually do this towards the end, but I'll, I'll remind me, and that is, um, it might be useful just for our audience to see what were the articles that you posted, um, or, you know, what the required reading was. And so that might be very interesting if we can come back to that. We'll see if we can post that on the SCA website if you're willing to do that. Um, that's something we could do. And it was really simple, really. I just wanted them to know how to keep themselves safe with PPE. And I wanted them to be exposed to something about OB or PEDS or critical error. Because we used to offer a one week subspecialty um, portion of the four week elective that they could rotate for a week on the subspecialty. And so, since they didn't have that exposure anymore, I just wanted them to get at least a flavor. What are some of the considerations for a pediatric patient? You know, do you take them away from their parent or not? And it, it was stuff that I want, you know, even just the emergency medicine or internal medicine when they work there, they'll know, oh, hey. Don't mess with that crying child who's drooling on all fours. <laughs> right. don't, okay. don't approach them. Don't, don't look at them funny if you don't have to. Uh, so they're, they're just those little pearls. And in, in the event that anyone was kicked off because of COVID exposure or contact tracing, they had a way of participating still, of learning still. And we had a simulation session that we did. Um, we did it once a week, but only half the students because of social distancing and they were able to practice procedures there. So if nothing else, if the ORs were completely canceled and they had no cases, we're still going to teach you how to intubate, how to put an IV in, how to use an ultrasound machine, which they really enjoyed. All right. Well, that's a great segue because, you know, now that leads us into, we've talked a lot about the online portion and now we can talk a little bit about what they were doing um, during their clinical days. So tell us about how you organized, you know, you've only got 10 days to work with them. So um, how did you, you know, how did you do that? So I think that's where we try to keep things organic. And I think one of the challenges always is, you know, medical students come in, they're actually usually at least two years apart from a CA1, right, in training, if not more, if they're working with a CA3. So they're two to four years apart. So I think a lot of times, it ends up looking like shadowing sometimes rather than like a, a true sub internship. Right. But, but, you know, we assign the medical students and in one of our, in one of our sites, it worked quite well. They were able to assign medical students to a faculty specifically. And the goal would be for that student to work with that faculty as consistently as possible in those two weeks with the hopes of gaining a letter recommendation. Um, and then in our institution, at our, our hospital site, it's a little more challenging to do that because our faculty are sometimes assigned to cases that may not be as good learning cases for the medical student. Right. And, you know, with the on call and post calls and, the, you know, we decided instead to have the students, um, you know, we paired them with the residents the best we were able to um, sometimes I tried to schedule them with senior residents initially. 
Uh, so they got kind of their basics down and the seniors were quite confident because we had brand new CA ones and twos here, right. unfortunately, which they can learn, but they won't get to do the procedures, which everyone loves to do procedures. Hands right. down. Um, and so we primarily just assigned them to the rooms and they did what they've always done is try to experience things from the anesthesiology perspective of what our roles are and what we do. So it sounds like a little bit of a scheduling challenge. Did you have to, were you responsible for making the schedule, assigning the residents to the rooms the following day? I scheduled the medical students. That's what I mean, the medical students. Yeah. You looked at all the rooms and all the residents and you tried to schedule everybody in? The thing that was fortunate for us is that we did not have third year medical students rotating. So because of our sheer numbers, we had six to seven uh, fourth year medical students rotating at a clinical site and we had no third years, which was unusual because all of our third year medical students due to COVID went through an online virtual anesthesia course uh, up front. And that's, I guess, an ongoing challenge in this future cycle is now these students didn't do a course or a, an elective. Um, how will they fit in into this curriculum compared to the other students? And actually they've done great. We've had a couple third years uh, just now starting through the same elective and there doesn't seem to be any problem with them going to the OR probably because they've also rotated on surgery and they have a little bit more comfort level in the operating room setting. Okay, so what you were worried about is the students that had gone through just the pure online portion as their clinical third year rotation on anesthesia that they may have somehow, uh, you know, be behind or had problems matriculating into the into the fourth year curriculum and you didn't find that to be true. So that's that's good. Very good. Yeah, at least. And I think we did some um, surveys before and after the elective and before and after the simulation session and talked about procedural numbers. And it seems comparable that the number of procedures they were able to obtain as far as peripheral IVs, bag mask, LMA, and ET tube placement was kind of comparable to what they've done before. Uh, okay. All right. So now tell us a little bit about the clinical days, because you mentioned at least one day uh, in the five days of each week was, or at least one time during their two week rotation was a sim session. The other days were just standard in the OR, show up, do your thing. And then did you have any other didactics or anything, or it was just that and then the online? Those were the basic two components. So the clinical component is 10 days clinically there. The sim session, I personally devoted myself 6.45 in the morning, I think it was 6.30 to 7.15. So it was a 45 minute session uh, before the OR started. Uh, Every day? Wednesday. Just one day, okay. So, so each, each student only had to go once. From okay. 30 to 6, uh, 6.30 to 7.15 was either a sim session or the CA1 Zoom lecture, um, just to get exposure to what are the residents learning? What would it be like for me to be a CA1? Now? And then 7.15 till 8, 8.15, that's when we have our grand rounds. So Okay, so that sounds like a lot to try to accomplish in a sim session in just uh, 45 minutes uh, or, or an hour, right? And that's what's interesting was that, you know, within 45 minutes, we were able to make progress. We were able to increase students' confidence levels in certain procedures. Um, I what think did you try to accomplish in that 45-minute um, sim session? So we ended up having probably eight to 10 minutes a station, and the three stations was the airway, you know, intubating, LMA, ET tube placement. Um, we had the glide scope there as well. And then the basic peripheral IV with the bags of red fluid. And then we had an ultrasound um, one with phantoms that they could practice IV skills there as well. Okay, cool. So, yeah, a lot of people cool. really liked it. They really wanted it up front. They, I think people wish they could do that first. Yes, right. Um, I guess in my mind, I was thinking that, you know, sometimes you can refine your techniques more after you've had exposure to it clinically that after you understand clinically, oh, this is what I'm trying to do. And it's like, oh, let me get better at it on the mannequin now. But um, I think all in all, more students really wish they could have had it the first week. Cause I had half of them had it the first week and half of them had it the second week. Right, I see. Yeah, so even some of them might have, were having it after they'd been a, a two thirds of their, you know, way or three quarters of the way through the sure. rotation. Okay. But I think right. the ultrasound, I mean, as far as how many IVs they were able to attempt, I think are like, the median they were getting was like three, so three or four. 
So, so that's a great, uh, a, you are just so good about this leading this interview for me, because that's always one of our questions is, you know, what kinds of things you measured as outcomes. And so I'm hearing you say that one of the things that you measured was procedures, numbers or procedures that they did. So did they keep, did they, did they keep a log or how did they, how did they record what their uh, procedures were? So I think in our pre-survey, we asked them how many of those procedures they had done before. And then at the end, we asked them how many they were able to accomplish. We didn't okay, make which ones were you counting? Uh, peripheral IV, bag mask, LMA, and ET tube. Okay, awesome. Um, and what kind of numbers did you end up? What, what did what did residents get at the end? Of, or sorry, medical students achieve at the end of two weeks? I think they're getting like three peripheral IVs, ten bag masks, five LMAs, and seven ET tubes. Or that was before the rotation. And then afterwards, about four peripheral IVs, 15 bag masks, three LMAs, 10 ET tubes. Um, cool. And we, I don't know if we've collected this data before, so I don't know like pre-COVID or post-COVID how that changes. But I think compared to the, what I'm assuming they obtained on their clerk, two-week clerkship, I think it was similar. Okay. Um, and I think one of the things is I really discouraged OR hopping, which. Um, yeah. I think just given the nature of COVID and not knowing whether you're walking into a 15 minute hold or or whether or not you need to have a mask or not for certain rooms with PUIs, I just didn't want too much traffic in and out. Um, so it's possible that historically on a four week elective, maybe they had gotten more procedures within a two week time frame because of OR hopping and because of less students on. I also didn't want crowding and clustering. I was very anxious actually that students, because of their anxiety and trying to match and having six, seven of them in the only two weeks that they would all be fighting for the same add-on case to try to do it. So I really tried to discourage that. And I actually even assigned them each an optional late call so that there was only one or two students who was assigned to stay late so that they would have their pick of the cases and things that were going on. Now, when you said assigned, but you also said it was optional. So Correct. which one was it? It was, they were given an assigned date that was their optional opportunity to take it. And if they chose not to, it was offered up to other students that wanted to take. Well, them. I have to ask, you know, how many, what percentage of the students took advantage of their assigned call day? Um, almost all. We They were supposed to all declare that they were planning to match into anesthesiology in order to get the elective. Uh, a few trickled through though that switched into EM or something and decided they weren't going right. anesthesia. And so there were there were probably two times that I was aware of at least where students chose not to take the late call. But one of the students reached out and it was actually her favorite portion of uh, the experience. She was on a trauma call and actually that student, um, I mean, she was able to diagnose torsades and and really participate in in that case. So that was a really stellar experience for her. Um, so other outcome measures um, were basically the the comments that you got. Do you want to share any other um, kind of feedback that you got about the about the rotation? So as you can tell, I mean, I gave them a lot of work, and there were several students that did not like that, that they really wished they were given the opportunity to just read about their cases in advance. Um, what I think happened though, I, I did solicit more feedback again after interview season. And so some of the feedback I got there was that on their interview trails, they felt very comfortable talking about anesthesia based on some of the journal articles that they had read during the elective. And because of all the case exposure they had read about and learned about, and we were trying intentionally to interact with the students in these discussions. So I would add in a Google images and links of different things to the anesthesiology to try to direct their learning with their cases as they posted it on the forums. Um, and through that, it gave me the opportunity to get to know the students virtually. Uh, so I ended up offering letters of recommendation to any student that took the elective and uh, soliciting because they weren't able to consistently work with one attending multiple times, I solicited the feedback from the various attendings, compiled it into comments for their letter recommendation, and included the academic work from the Canvas site um, about the, you know, whatever teaching video they did. In my mind, it really created control for the students. So the students that wanted to shine, who would have ordinarily gotten honors, 
I gave them the path and the road. Here's how you do it. Here, here's so, what it takes to engage in to do it. So you did a lot of work, um, additional work that we haven't discussed. It sounds like you gave them a package at the end of all of their comments and things that they could provide to somebody that was going to write them a letter. No, I actually wrote 23 letters of recommendation. Okay. As a course director. As a course director. Okay. So I compiled it for them. Um, I don't think anyone asked me to, I mean, I surely could have compiled things and given it to somebody else to have them write it. Um, okay. But for those students who were not able to consistently interact with the faculty, like I was that faculty for them. I met them during the office hours once a week. I was involved. I saw their posts and their responses and their critical thinking skills in their journal club discussions and their case log. Uh, in their learning points, in the way they interacted with their peers. I saw their effort put forth. On so campus. you spent a lot of time online on that Canvas platform because, like you said, they were supposed to post something. They might have posted comments about the journal article. And then every day they were posting something about the case that they did. So, and you were supplementing that learning by saying, oh, that was an interesting case. Here's an image. Here's an article or whatever about that case. Um, so, all right, let's be honest now, how much time were you spending, uh, I guess every night doing that? Um, I mean, sometimes it'd take like half an hour or so, I think. Okay. I it, thought it was going to be a couple might, of hours. <laughs> it, it definitely adds up and I had help. So, you know, Dr. Webb and Dr. Gio are also on there commenting and posting as they were able oh, okay. to. Okay. All right. So, so there was help with that, but. Again, this is this is where I knew that my involvement and engagement to help these students succeed was going to take academic time, and and I negotiated for that. <laughs> and uh, I know I, I, I too just to say, listen, like this is the amount of time it takes to do a good job as an educator, and and, and um, much as I would love to do that voluntarily, uh, you know, I have other commitments in my life too. So yeah, no, I, I like I I hope everybody watches this interview because I think. You did a fantastic job, um, just a wonderful, wonderful model of engaging um, the medical students and helping them be successful. It's too bad that this interview is taking place before match day because it would have been interesting as another outcome is to look at how well your um, your trainees do in the match. Maybe that's something you might be able to post as a supplement later, um, but how well they did in the match, um, you know, maybe how did they get one of their first five choices, or I don't know how you want to measure that outcome, but that'd be interesting. All right, well, I want to finish it up with a couple of things. Um, one is, you know, you, you started it, you did it. Was there anything you had to change or in, that you're planning to change based on the feedback that you got or your experience in doing this project? So, yeah, the feedback enormously, and it's hard to tell because there's going to be a subset of people who really appreciate and understand my goal and vision of helping them and love it. Uh, and then there's going to be a subset of people that say, why are you making me do all this work? I hate it. <laughs> and then there's going to be a proportion of people who don't care enough either which way or too lazy to respond. So you never really hear back from them. <laughs> so, so, you know, because of a lot of the negative feedback about how much work it was and how they didn't like all the different assignments, um, which, you know, I organized for their benefit. I actually eliminated a lot of that. So moving forward, they only have to do one journal club once a week. Um, I still kept the case log discussions because that's the thing they really liked. I made the YouTube. When you say case log discussion, that when posting one case about one case each day. Okay. Yeah. And okay. actually, I mean, one student commented like, oh, I never thought about having a learning point from every single case I do. And I was like, yeah, you actually can come yeah. up with something and you can share it with everybody. And then everyone has 10 pearls that they're taking away every single day and it makes you stronger and better. Um, you know, maybe this is something that we could even think about implementing with our new CA ones. Yeah. I mean, I think a lot of what I was training them to think about um, is also still the evidence-based medicine. I mean, sometimes they would report back, I learned this and I would say, can you support that? <laughs> Like, you know, especially if it was something I disagreed with, <laughs> um, you know, I'd say, well, you know, here's some thoughts about this or that. And to be able to gently correct them and to always challenge them to think about why you make the decisions you do. Um, Brilliant. 
even the residents, I find, you know, well, that's the way I was taught to do it, as opposed to some critical thinking about, right. well, why would we do it that way? What's right. the pro? What's the con? That's so what we always do. Fantastic. So-and-so told me to do, and that's what we do, and it works. Well, is there another way? Should we think about it and flip it upside right. down and examine it and look at it from a different angle and think, like, what is the best way and why? And can you defend it on the oral boards? That'll be even more interesting. But All right. Well, uh, yeah. Fantastic interview. You are so engaging. I am so impressed with your project. It, it just sounds like you've done a wonderful job. I've never heard anybody discuss in such a great way about what they were doing to really um, incorporate all of these elements for medical student training and to help them. I mean, you so much focus on, you know, being able to interview and a Zoom interview and reflection and how to think about critical thinking. Fantastic. You know, A plus, A plus. <laughs> what, I, what I would like you to do, though, is if possible, and I don't know, we'll try. We'll see if we can get the SCA. But anything that you can add as a supplemental package that you might want to post along with this interview um, that might help other people uh, sort of replicate what you've done. So we talked about maybe what you thought were the key journal articles. Not, may, I guess, maybe not the whole list now that you decided to cut it down. Um, you know, any whatever key points that you wanted to make, take home messages. That'd be great. I think what's interesting is one of the articles was the surviving sepsis COVID guidelines. Uh -huh. And what's interesting now is that the students reading it now are like, this is old data. <laughs> but, but it's fascinating to me because it gives them that historical perspective already that within one year, how far we've come. Or yeah. on top of that, they're looking at it and they're like, wow, the evidence is really weak on all of these recommendations. Yeah, that's what we're working with. And so I'm hoping that even if they don't pursue anesthesiology, if they go and become internal medicine doctors, emergency medicine doctors, whichever, that they will take that away from them and kind of still understand what we do as a specialty, if nothing else. Well, that's another outcome that we'd want to look at is what percentage of them, um, you know, that said that they intended to match an anesthesiology. Of course, we have no idea if they're telling the truth or not. And then they just wanted to do a rotation on anesthesiology, you know, but uh, it'd be really interesting to know what percentage of them ended up actually matching, you know, and then how well they did in the match.